Hi, I'm Mitu. I'm a programmer and designer, and I run what is ostensibly a one-person micro-studio called The Tiniest Shark. I made a game called Red Shirt, which is this satirical sci-fi social networking simulation game. I say ostensibly one person because I didn't make Red Shirt alone, of course. I had help from some wonderful artists, without whom it would never have got past the placeholder art stage, and the talented musician, and the voiceover artist, Greetings. and the friends who helped with writing content when I was knee-deep in making sure the scroll bars worked properly. And that's not even mentioning the emotional support of my husband, of my parents, and my friends who understood every time I'd have to rearrange hanging out with them because something was on fire. And unless you're someone with an absolutely unprecedented level of talent and bottomless emotional strength, no developer is an island. But you probably know this. You know this because you're here at the 2015 Global Game Jam, and you're ready to work with the talented people who are also here. You know this because you all showed up. You're here on the ground, and really showing up is half the battle. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm incredibly honoured to be one of the keynote speakers for the Global Game Jam. But because you all showed up, I will be completely truthful when I say this. There is probably nothing I can tell you that you don't already know. I could tell you why games are so important, why they have so much potential, why they belong on the same cultural platforms as movies and literature and theatre and visual art. I do those talks to the public from time to time, because I believe advocacy for games and what they are and what they could be is so important. But you probably believe these things about games too, and you are awesome because you've showed up with this commitment to making a game, to doing something hopefully a bit different, whether this is your first ever game jam and you've never made a game before, or whether you're someone who's been in the industry for 15 years. Again. There's nothing I can tell you that you don't already know. Let's leave potential aside then. What I can do is tell you why I love games, in the here and now, and what games mean to me. This is where I grew up, ten minutes from the sea. I've always loved the sea. When I was very little, the sea meant all of this possibility. I would dream about all the places it could take me. I loved the sea for the same reasons I loved space later. The seemingly infinite. The places which make you remember that you are infinitely tiny and unimportant, and that's okay, because that's what makes life so precious. I came to realise later that this definitely affected the way I think about and make video games. That we're tiny, but we're all so connected to one another, more than we know. And the things we do matter. And so, a lot, not all of the games I aspire to make, are about this slow bombardment of opportunities for self-reflection. Places in video games have made me feel that way too. Tiny, I mean. I remember, for instance, the sense of wonder when I played my first MMO, EverQuest. Of being in this huge world which seemed to live and breathe without me, and it was full, absolutely full of people. Of course, there's no one here now, but I have stories. And really, that's what it's about to me. The stories. The connections we make. I grew up playing video games with my family and my little sisters, and the thing I love is that, no matter the game, it's about the unique stories you craft between you and your friends, or between you and the system, or you with yourself. Every time we play, there's some unique story we create, no matter why else we may be playing. Whether it's about control, or challenge, or just out of pure kinesthetic pleasure. I love creating. I've loved making things, digital things, since I was about 10 or 11 years old, and I taught myself to write HTML. I was hooked on being able to make things, interactive things for my friends to look at and mess about with. There's something to it that's addictive and beautiful. Crafting things, spinning things from inert code which becomes something else, comes alive on the screen. To me, it feels magical. And games are the best place for that magic. To express ideas through the code you've spun. 
My earliest understanding of all this came, I realised, not from Will Wright or Sid Meier, but from early 90s Nickelodeon show Clarissa Explains It All, in which 13-year-old girl Clarissa Darling would seemingly, in just a few hours, make a game to both figure out and express to others how to deal with her bratty little brother, Ferguson. I like to think that Clarissa not only paved the way years and years in advance for the amazing plethora of indie games about personal experiences that we now see, but also I think she basically invented game jams. But I have a confession to make. For a while, as I saw the amazing, beautiful, expressive work that was being done around me, I was honestly too scared to put my own work out there, and so I'd make these little barely finished games in private and show them to no one, or worse, and far more often, not even build out my ideas in case by doing so I'd prove to myself that they weren't worth it. And you know what? It didn't make me happy. I'm not a writer, but one of the most important moments of my creative life came a few years ago when I read this Agony Aunt column. It's by a writer responding to another writer who's been besieged by this all-encompassing sense of creative angst, of all the things they feel like they could do but they're too afraid to because the things they come out with aren't good enough. Honestly, I think it applies to all creative disciplines. The Agony Aunt's advice in her amazing, colourfully worded column came down to this. We get the work done on the ground level, with humility and with surrender. And reading this cemented for me what made me the happiest, creating fully, uninhibitedly and honestly, not really caring about the outcome as long as I was creating something. In fact, I'm kind of miserable when I'm not. And you know what else? Despite this, despite the fact that I create and care about creating, I've had people telling me I'm not a game developer, not a real one. But you know what? I just keep showing up. But you already know this, because you showed up, and you're ready to try and maybe fail, but that's okay, because you'll be doing your best. You're here, you're on the ground level, and so there is nothing I can tell you but to remind you that with humility and with surrender, like a Oi, eu sou a Amora. E eu sou o Pedro, e juntos a gente é a mini boss, e a gente faz jogo independente aqui no Brasil. Personagens de jogos, principalmente jogos AAA, são feitos dentro de imagens muito restritas na maioria das vezes. O cara branco, hétero e ultimamente o anti-herói é o que a gente mais vê por aí. Temos uma parcela muito baixa de personagens de outras raças, gêneros e orientações sexuais sendo protagonistas ou simplesmente assumindo papéis fortes. Quando encontramos personagens diferentes desse padrão, são muitas vezes representados de maneira estereotipada, alegórica, sexualizada ou simplesmente negativa, mal feita. Antes de criar uma história e seus personagens, é legal tentar pensar um pouco fora desse formato com o qual estamos acostumados. Isso serve para qualquer mídia, inclusive jogos, e qualquer situação, inclusive uma game jam como a que você está prestes a fazer. Em muitos jogos, vemos personagens femininas que estão ali só para servir de decoração ou como apelo sexual para o público masculino. Isso acaba tirando o aspecto humano da personagem, fazendo com que ela tenha a mesma personalidade de um objeto. Outros exemplos menos óbvios são personagens femininas que são fortes e inteligentes, mas só estão na história como motivação para o cara principal. Ou para ensinar alguma coisa para ele, torná-lo melhor de algum jeito. São personagens que perdem sua força para que não tenham nenhum impacto real na trama. Muitas vezes temos como desculpa que uma história representa a realidade, e se tem um tom machista, racista, transfóbico ou homofóbico é porque é assim na vida real. Isso cria um ciclo, e esse ciclo é uma das armadilhas que a gente mais tem que tentar evitar. A ficção, vista em filmes, livros, seriados e em jogos, é influenciada pela realidade, mas também pode fazer o caminho inverso. Se temos esse tipo de poder, por que não usá-lo? Nós temos a chance de criar qualquer coisa, então podemos trazer ideias e conceitos para o público que inspirem mudanças em nosso meio, ao invés de ficar perpetuando o mesmo ciclo e alimentando um mundo cada vez mais conformista. 
Então, como fazer o certo? O que é um personagem forte? Personagens fortes são aqueles que possuem profundidade, capazes de influenciar diretamente a história em que estão inseridos. Se a cor do seu personagem fosse outra, se a raça, a orientação sexual, o tipo físico fossem diferentes, isso mudaria a história em alguma coisa? Ninguém deve ser definido por essas características, e sim pelas suas ações. Em relação a personagens femininas, um teste que gostamos de fazer é o teste de ber... 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 Ao analisar uma história, veja se ela tem mais de uma mulher. Se sim, elas chegam a conversar uma com a outra? E se conversam, é sobre qualquer coisa além dos homens da história? Esse teste é bem simples e, claro, não se aplica a tudo. Mas é um bom começo para a análise e é um ótimo exercício para o nosso cérebro como criadores. Errar nesses pontos é normal e bem comum, mesmo quando a intenção é boa. O importante é participar da discussão e tentar se livrar dessa noção de que o homem branco ou heterossexual precisa ser o padrão. A diversidade dentro dos jogos é importante, mas fora deles é mais ainda. Tente não ser intolerante por causa de generalizações sem sentido, como mulheres não gostam de videogame, porque isso é muito nocivo para o seu trabalho e para a nossa cultura como um todo. Vamos tentar não espantar pessoas que poderiam trazer grandes contribuições para a nossa área e não ter medo de trabalhar com todo tipo de gente. E é isso. O tempo foi curto, mas espero que a gente tenha conseguido resumir de um jeito legal. Lembre-se de que a indústria de jogos é feita por todos nós e é nossa obrigação deixá-la cada vez melhor. Boa tchau! My name is Rainer Knizia. I'm a game designer. We live in exciting times. Advances in electronics change our world and change our games. Maybe soon, gamification will drive all aspects of our lives. In the past, we focused on creating powerful virtual worlds. In the future, I believe success will come from merging virtual worlds and the real world. Hybrid games, which combine physical and digital elements, are our first step into the future. The island uses a board, and then we add electronics through the volcano. The board is printed with conductive ink, and that means whenever we touch the board, the magic happens. Who was it? is a crime mystery. We are in a castle. And we add an electronic box. The chest gives you choices. In which room do you act? Which animal do you ask? And you touch the chest and the magic happens. Supremacy uses a magic die. The die is linked to the tablet. There is the game. To get the magic going, all you need to do is roll the die. Our next game uses the smartphone as an integral part. The smartphone is placed above the board. So, in King Arthur, the smartphone up there sees all, knows all, and controls all, just like in real life. The future is up to you. Enjoy. <laughs>